often waken up in the middle of the night, all of a sudden at two o'clock in the morning, just staring at the ceiling or feeling anxious. That was one of the things that I really noticed for myself is I was waking up in the middle of the night with panic attacks for no reason. Like there was nothing bad going on. I wasn't worried about anything, but I was having the physical symptoms of panic attacks. And luckily as a doctor, I at least knew what was happening because when you have a panic attack, it feels like you're dying. I mean, it's really miserable, but it was so confusing. And all of these things can be symptoms of what we call estrogen dominance, which means that your estrogen, it could be too high or at least normal, but now your progesterone is declining because progesterone tends to decline even years before estrogen declines. Hello, hello. I'm your host for today, Dr. Carrie Jones, and I am so excited to have on Dr. Deb Matthew. She is known as America's happy hormones expert. She's an international speaker. She's an author of the book, This Is Not Normal, all about your hormones. And she, of course, runs the BHRT practice launch. Now, today, we are going to talk all about hormones and bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So if you are perimenopausal or menopausal and you're stuck, you're confused, you're frustrated, you're scared, and you have all these questions, Dr. Deb Matthew is the person that you should listen to today. Dr. Deb Matthew, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine Podcast. I am so thrilled to have you on because I couldn't think of anyone better to talk about BHRT or just hormone replacement in general than the expert queen herself. So thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. It looks like fun. My gosh. Well, we, as you can imagine, get a lot of questions around just hormone replacement therapy. There's a lot of fear around it. There's a lot of when, who, how, can I, should I? And we're going to kind of a little bit rapid fire those questions to you, if you are okay with that. Hit me with them. <laughs> All right. So one of the first questions that we get a lot, we're going to just start at the basics. What is HRT or even BHRT when people use that acronym? Okay. So horm HRT is hormone replacement therapy, which simply means if you're deficient in a hormone we're going to give you back the hormone so that your body can do what it needs to do. And BHRT is bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And that's a really important key distinction because in the past, when we've done hormone replacement therapy, a lot of times what we have used are synthetic man-made chemicals that are never actually found in a woman's body, but they mimic our hormones and they're not exactly the same thing, which means they don't have all the same benefits and, and they don't have all the same risks. When we use bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, that means that we're using a hormone that is identical to what our body made. And so at least in theory, our body cannot tell the difference between did it come from our ovaries or did it come from the pharmacy? And therefore it's going to behave the same as our own hormones. And so there's been some debate about which is better in the medical community, but even just like logic and common sense is, would you want to eat a synthetic tomato? Like, would you want a tomato? kind of, the, to me, it's the same thing. Yeah, that makes total sense. And speaking of hormone therapy, I do get this question a lot. There are a lot of women question HRT. They're in their mind, I think, thinking estrogens, but there's more to estrogen than HRT. Can you walk us through all the examples? Yeah. And, and this is something that has created so much confusion because when we talk about hormone replacement therapy, what most people think, as you said, is estrogen. And then the next thing they think is breast cancer. So hopefully we'll have a chance to kind of go through some of those myths. But you have a lot of hormones in your body and estrogen is only one of them. And so estrogen, of course, is, you know, one of the ones that goes up and down over your menstrual cycle and it triggers a period. But progesterone is another one that also goes up and down over the menstrual cycle. It is very different than estrogen. It has very different roles to play, but it is just as important. And it actually tends to decline way before estrogen does. So for women who are, say, in their late 30s and in their 40s, their estrogen still may be fine, but progesterone may be the culprit for them. And then there's testosterone and testosterone, we think of it for men, but women have testosterone too. In fact, women have 10 times more testosterone than estrogen. It's just that men have 10 times more testosterone than women do, but it is so important. And so all of these hormones come from our ovaries and they do change, you know, as we get towards menopause. But even then, there are a lot of other hormones that also impact these hormones or that are impacted by these hormones. So 
cortisol is another one, which is our stress hormone. And when we have a problem with cortisol, it often tends to shut down ovarian function. It interferes with how the other hormones work. So in my experience, if somebody came in and they were having some symptoms and I just wrote them a prescription for hormone therapy, and I didn't also look at what was going on with their cortisol, we don't get the best results. There's thyroid, there's insulin. There are a lot of different hormones that all work together. So really, in my opinion, when I say bioidentical hormones, I'm not just talking about the chemical structure of that hormone. What I'm really meaning is the approach to women's hormones, where we're looking at the whole person, we're looking holistically, we're looking at the balance of how all of these hormones are interacting. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what we all want. We all deserve balanced hormones, no matter how old we are. You know, sometimes that means bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Sometimes it means doing some lifestyle changes or taking some nutritional supplements, but we all deserve balanced hormones no matter how old we are. I absolutely love that. And I love that approach, especially because sometimes, and you probably see this too, women will say, I don't feel well. I want to go on hormones and maybe they're given estrogen, progesterone, let's say estradiol and progesterone, and that's it. Nothing else is looked at. They've Nobody's ever looked at their thyroid. No one's ever looked at their cortisol. No one ever has looked at their glucose, insulin, et cetera. And they may feel better for a while. And then they're like, I need more. This isn't the right dose. I like a different style. When, as you said, it's a whole body approach. Yeah. I, I hear like women sometimes, you know, in online groups and things like that saying, like I was so excited. I went to get hormone replacement therapy and I got it. I was thinking I was going to lose weight and all these great things were going to happen, but I still have all these symptoms. And it's almost like they feel like it's going to be the magic pill that's going to fix everything, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece, but we got to look at the whole puzzle. And at what age should a woman really start to think about or ask their practitioner about hormones? That is such an important question because we can have hormone problems no matter how old we are. So there are teenagers that have hormone problems, right? How many teenagers have terrible cramps and heavy periods and they have to miss school because they're so miserable on their period? So that's a hormone issue, but it doesn't need hormone replacement therapy. And then when women are in their, you know, 20s and 30s, the most common hormone imbalance is PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a problem with a, a bunch of different hormones that there's a lot that can be done to treat it. But that is often a problem for women who are younger, like nowhere near menopause. But once women are over the age of 35, so kind of late 30s and into their 40s, this is the phase in our life that we call perimenopause, which just, it's really puberty in reverse. You know, it, it took a little bit to get our hormones moving as we went through puberty. So now they're kind of slowly notching down. And for some women, this perimenopausal phase in our life, it can last for years and years and years. So any woman who's over the age of 35 could potentially be a candidate for thinking about what's going on with her hormones and how we would know if this is something for you to think about would be your symptoms. So we'll need to go in and talk about like, what does that look like? The average age of menopause, meaning like when your periods have stopped, the average age is about 52. And so there's lots of variations, but by the time women are into their 50s is when the ovaries are kind of cooking down and that's when we're kind of thinking about menopause. Okay, let's cover those two separately. You've got, there's a perimenopausal woman listening. She's she's in that late 30s into her 40s range and she's symptomatic. We've had people on here on the podcast before talking about hormones and perimenopause and menopause, but you're, you know, you're listening to this because you're like, yep, I'm, I'm really considering hormone replacement therapy your perimenopausal, how do you approach that? Like, how would you talk to them about that? Risks, testing, to where do we start? Can you do estradiol in the 40? <laughs> There's all these same questions I see over and over, and I thought I'll, I'll just ask Dr. Deb. Okay. So let's just take our imaginary person. She's 40 years old. She is all of a sudden having like heavier periods than ever before, a whole bunch of PMS. Like it used to be, she'd have like maybe two days of feeling kind of cranky. And now that period of crankiness is stretching out for like five days, seven days, 10 days. Like now it's like there's one good week in the month and the rest of the time she's not feeling good. Often waking up in the middle of the night, like all of a sudden at two o'clock in the morning, just staring at the ceiling or feeling anxious. That was one of the things that I really noticed for myself is 
I was waking up in the middle of the night with panic attacks for no reason. Like there was nothing bad going on. I, I wasn't worried about anything, but I was having the physical symptoms of panic attacks. And luckily as a doctor, I at least knew what was happening because when you have a panic attack, it feels like you're dying. I mean, it's really miserable, but it was so confusing. And all of these things can be symptoms of what we call estrogen dominance, which means that your estrogen, it could be too high or at least normal, but now your progesterone is declining because progesterone tends to decline even years before estrogen declines. So now we get this estrogen dominance. Progesterone is the calming hormone. It's the one that helps us sleep soundly at night. So now we're waking up. It's the one that helps us feel chilled out and relaxed. So now we're anxious and we're irritable and our husband chews too loud. And like the kids are just on your last nerve. And, you know, I have a very unscientific theory that if you look at all these women out there that we're calling Karens and they're misbehaving and they're saying stupid things, if you look at them, they all tend to be women kind of, you know, in this perimenopausal age range who could all probably use just a little bit of extra progesterone to just chill them out. But so the way to know if you should be thinking about these hormones is do you kind of fit some of these symptoms? Are things changing for you? And honestly, the most common thing that I hear women say when they come in to see me is, I still feel like myself. Like this is not normal. Something is not right. I just want, I just want to be me again. But one of the patients came in and she said, I just want Lori back. And if you can just imagine if you march into your gynecologist, your family practice doctor, and you say, I don't feel like me, like this is not normal. I, something is wrong. That's just got Prozac written all over it, doesn't it? I mean, what are they going to do for you? But it really could be your hormones. And the most likely culprit at this age is low progesterone and testosterone. So testosterone can also start to decline. And testosterone is important to keep your muscles and bones strong so that you don't become a frail little old lady and you know fall down and your bones snap like a twig. It's also important for everything to do with sex. So if your testosterone goes down, the, it, it's important for like the idea even popping into your head in the first place. Like the desire goes down, the arousal, it's harder to have an orgasm, like just everything goes down. And that's another hard one. Cause if you march into the doctor to say, listen, things are changed. Like I just, I, I really could care less anymore, but you know, now it's causing some problems with my spouse. Like what do they got to offer? I mean, you know, but this is a really real thing that is fixable. And then the other thing that I think, I think probably some women know that testosterone is important for libido, but also it's so important for how we feel on the inside for confidence, motivation, drive, get up and go, get things done. It's that zip in our step. And so we just feel kind of flat, kind of blah, kind of eh. And if something really has to happen today, we'll make it happen. But if it doesn't really have to happen today, we tend to just procrastinate, push it to the side and say, you know, forget about it. So if any of this resonates, like if, if somebody fits the picture, the first thing to do would be to get your hormones measured. And that sounds so easy, doesn't it? Just go get your hormones measured. But here again, if you march on into your gynecologist's office, your primary care doctor's office, and you say, hey, I'm feeling this, that, and the other, I kind of think it might be my hormones. I want to get my hormones checked. Here's what you hear typically is one of the following of the menu. We don't do that. You're too young to have a hormone problem. What you're feeling is just normal. Like it, it sort of gets dismissed. And it's not because doctors are bad people. It's not because they don't care. It's not because they don't want to help you. It's just we weren't trained to do that. That was not part of our medical education because we are really trained to look for diseases. And this isn't a disease, right? We're all going to go through menopause. I really love Dr. Annika Becca says, menopause is mandatory, but suffering is optional. But we're all going to go through these changes, right? And so looking for hormone levels is just not done. Another reason that doctors will say they don't do it is because as we're going through a monthly cycle, our hormones are going up and down. So if you're in the office on some random Thursday afternoon, it might be the completely wrong time in your cycle. Like we need to know where you are in your cycle in order to make any sense of the lab results. So it's not as easy as you would think to get your hormones tested. It actually, though, it, it shouldn't be so hard because we've got lots of ways we can measure your hormones. So first off, if you're perimenopausal and you're having periods, we want to do it approximately day 19, 20, or 21 of your cycle. So day one is the first day you start bleeding. So 19 or 21 days after that is the time in your cycle when progesterone is supposed to be at its peak. So that's when we do the test. We can do blood testing. 
We can do saliva testing. We can do urine testing. Each one has pros and cons. And if you want to, we can go into the pros and cons. But in a nutshell, what I would say to people listening is whichever one your practitioner is the most confident in, knows how to interpret, is used to working with, it's going to be okay. They all have their pros and cons. None are perfect, but they all can work. So you can get your hormone levels tested. And this gives us so much information because you can have estrogen dominance symptoms because your estrogen is too high. And then we need to do something for that. Or it can be that your estrogen is fine and your progesterone is too low. So we might do something different for that. So it really helps us to understand For me, if I'm going to be measuring somebody's hormones, I don't want to stop with estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone because there's more information to be had. We can look at metabolites, so how your body is breaking down these hormones. We can look at cortisol because cortisol regulates all our hormones. And when cortisol is off, none of the other ones are going to work as well. We want to look at a full thyroid panel. We want to understand how insulin is working because all the hormones affect each other. And if we can get the big picture, we can help so much more. Oh my gosh, I love this. And don't worry, everyone. I am going to ask her about like ways of application and doses and risks, but I want to move our 40-year-old avatar. Now she is 52. She's 52. She hasn't had a period. She's completely menopausal and completely symptomatic. How would you address this differently? Or would you? Yeah, well, so I would still start with measuring hormone levels because not everybody who goes through menopause has the same hormonal pattern. Like we assume your hormone levels are low, but some women are still able to make testosterone fairly well. And if you, because some of our testosterone does come from our ovaries and as our ovaries shut down, that's going to go down. But we can also make some testosterone from adrenal function. So your adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys, they make adrenaline and cortisol. And so if you have really healthy, good, strong adrenal function, you can actually make some testosterone. You might have more mild symptoms and and you don't need, we don't need to give you more testosterone. So we really want to understand your personal pattern. So I would still start by measuring the hormones. At this time, it doesn't, there's no cycle, right? So it doesn't matter day 19 or 20, just whatever day, it doesn't really matter anymore, which makes it even that much easier. Okay. When it comes to estrogen, I want to dive into this because I think this is where you get the most questions. I get the most questions. First and foremost- I get the most wild up. I, <laughs> good, as you should. I, but I, I just have to, I have to make sure I answer this question and don't forget, is there too late a time in a woman's life to start hormones? I get asked this a lot. Like my mom is 72 and still really symptomatic or I myself was told they're super dangerous and now I'm realizing they're not. Can I start? Is there a too old? I'm too old which I hate the phrase, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So we're going to bust some myths. Yes. Oh, I love it. Okay. So first of all, the reason that you're even kind of asking this question is because there was a big study. And one of the things that the study found is that when women started on the hormones relatively younger, like, you know, within five or 10 years of menopause, they did really quite well. When they started on the hormones quite a bit older, like after, you know, being menopausal already 20 years, they had some more risks and specifically it tended to be risks of blood clots. So we have to say that we were giving these women estrogen by a pill. We were giving synthetic progesterone, not the natural kind of progesterone. And those are things that can increase the risk of a blood clot. So we're giving women a pill that was increasing the risk of a blood clot And then shockingly enough, they were having more blood clots. Like we knew this, we know birth control pills, for example, increase your risk for a blood clot. So when you're 19, your risk of a blood clot is so low that even if the risk goes up, it's still pretty small. When you're 70, it's a whole different story. So one of the things that was happening is if you take a medicine that increases your risk for a blood clot, a blood clot in the heart would be a heart attack. A blood clot in your brain would be a stroke. So we were seeing a little bit more blood clots and heart attacks. And the older women got, the greater their risks. When women were really, you know, around the time of menopause, the benefits of the hormones very clearly outweighed the risks. We actually had less colon cancer, less hip fractures, you know, less osteoporosis. And that doesn't even count all of the like, sex is not painful. They're not buying out the Depenzile because they're leaking urine. They can remember why they walked in the room, you know, all the benefits of the hormones. So, but that's why there's some fear about prescribing hormones to older women. If women have been on hormones from the beginning and then they're going through, there seems to be less 
concern amongst the medical community because because it's preventive. So we would recommend if you're going to be on hormone therapy, do plan to start it early and go forward because it's preventive. You can't start it when you're 70 and go back and, and erase the aging that's already happened. So in my opinion, I believe that there are a lot of benefits of hormone therapy. It can help with the vaginal dryness, the painful sex, the urinary leakage. It can help your bones at any age. It helps with skin health. It helps with energy and mood and all sorts of things. How we give you the hormones really matters. So the studies that were done looked at synthetic hormones. They were given orally. So if we were giving women bioidentical hormones, topically, which doesn't have the same risk for blood clots, then I feel like there are still some benefits, especially how I typically do it for women who are older. Like, let's just say a 70 year old woman walks in the door and the re usually at that point, it's not because of hot flash, right? Like they're, that's over, but oftentimes it's because they're having vaginal dryness, sex is painful, um, leaking urine. And so even conventional regular doctors are typically fine with giving vaginal estrogen, no matter what the age, even for women who've had a history of breast cancer, they're usually pretty good at giving some vaginal estrogen, at least to help with those symptoms. So for me, I wouldn't stop there though. I would give whichever hormones they need, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, you know, let's get the full benefits and you know, it can, it can really help and it can make women feel better. However, not all doctors agree with me. And so again, if you march into your gynecologist, your family doctor's office, and you're 70 years old and sex hurts and you're peeing your pants and you say, listen, could I try some hormones to see if it would help me? Maybe they would be willing to give you some vaginal estrogen, which may or may not be bioidentical and may or may not have parabens and other not so great ingredients in the, you know, cream or suppository or whatever, but, but they're less likely to do the whole picture for you. Right. Okay. Well, and along with this, in a similar regard, I get asked or I get told, well, my practitioner put me on hormones, but said I'm only allowed to be on them for 10 years. At 10 years, I have to go off. And I said, well, you're going to lose the benefit. It's an on off switch. They don't last forever. They don't like linger in your system. You're going to get rid of them. She said, well, my doctor said only 10 years. And I do hear this quite a bit. Can you talk about that? Yes. Or, or what their doctor says is at whatever age, like when you turn 60 or when you turn 65. Okay. So again, the reason for this line of thinking, this is kind of twofold. One is older women were having more side effects from the synthetic pills that we were giving them. They were having more blood clots. And also when we were giving women the synthetic pills, there was a small increase in the risk for breast cancer. So the way the media said it, you would have thought women are dropping like flies from breast cancer from these pills, but eight more breast cancers per 10,000 women, which is less than 1%. So 99.99 something percent, you're not going to have you know, a risk for breast cancer from the hormones, but that's not the message that women got. So doctors got scared of hormones and the thinking was, okay, well, it's fine for the younger women. We see that the benefits outweigh the risk for the younger women, not so much for the older women. So we're going to save you by getting you off your hormones. But there's no science behind that. So the North American Menopause Society, I, I want to say it was in 2019, came out with a new position statement that basically said there is no medical evidence to say that women need to come off hormones just because they've hit a certain birthday, especially if they're getting some kind of benefit. So if you have osteoporosis or if you have, you know, urinary leakage or vaginal dryness, if sex was painful, if, if the hormones are helping you, there is no medical or scientific reason to say that you must come off the hormones. Okay. Lo this, this makes me so happy. I swear everyone shouldn't even know what questions I was going to ask her ahead of time. I just have followed Deb for a while. I've learned from her myself and uh, she studies the research religiously. And so this is why I'm having her on today. Let's, let's do the elephant in the room. Let's talk about breast cancer because I get it. It's scary. It's the last thing you want to hear as a woman that the press, as you said, around hormone replacement therapy and making it seem like everyone's going to develop breast cancer is unfortunate. So let's dive into that topic. Okay. I'm going to take a deep breath here because it gets me so angry. Okay. When I was in medical school in the nineties, we were all taught 
that hormone replacement therapy was the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's going to protect your bones. It's going to protect your brain. It's going to protect your heart. We had all this medical evidence to show just how fabulous these hormones are for women. It's going to prevent all these degenerative diseases that we get when we age. And then in 2002, this big study came out, the Women's Health Initiative study, and that's the one that said, whoa, stop the press, more breast cancer. And so overnight, hormones went from the greatest thing since sliced bread to, you know, danger, danger. And somehow that got so seared into our psyche, both women, but also the doctors, because the first day of medical school, we take an oath. And part of that oath says, first, do no harm. And so we, as the medical profession, were so horrified to think that we were recommending this something and we were actually increasing the risk for breast cancer. Like that was so horrifying to us that now we can't undo that mistake. So here's the real truth, because we've had 20 years now to like sift through all the evidence and redo the statistics and all that. What we know is in that study, there were two groups of women. One group of women was given a pill that had uh, a kind of estrogen that comes from horses. It's called Premarin and the synthetic form of progesterone. That's just a man-made chemical that was never found in a woman's body before. Those women did have a very slight increase in the risk for breast cancer, about eight extra cases per 10,000. The other group of women had had a hysterectomy for whatever reason, and they only got estrogen because originally we used to only give estrogen. And then we found that we were causing problems, uterine bleeding and uterine cancer and things like that. And we realized the two hormones have to work together. But if you've had a hysterectomy, then you were just given estrogen. Well, those women who only got estrogen did not have an increase in the risk for breast cancer. In fact, they had a slight decrease in the risk for breast cancer. And if we go back and we look at all the studies out there on hormones and breast cancer, what we see is fairly consistently women who got estrogen only because they didn't have a uterus had a decrease in the risk for breast cancer, not an increase. They had a decrease. The problem comes with this synthetic progestin, this synthetic form of progesterone. It's not a big risk, but but some studies did show, some studies didn't. We have the natural, the bioidentical progesterone, and the studies do not show an increase in the risk of breast cancer if you use the natural form, just the synthetic one, which is still being used, which is so shocking because the natural one is readily available. Like, I, I can't imagine why people still do the other one. It's because the doctors don't know the difference is why. But so it is not estrogen that increases the risk for breast cancer, no matter what your doctor tells you or like, it's just... It's so ingrained in our psyche that that's just been so hard for doctors to unlearn. But the studies clearly say that if we give you just estrogen, that you have a reduction, at least a small reduction in the risk for breast cancer. And if we give you estrogen and progesterone, there's no increase in the risk for breast cancer. Now, you could get breast cancer anyway, on hormones, not on hormones, right? Breast cancer is really scary. It is mostly triggered by toxins in the environment. And, you know, we live in a very toxic world. The toxins impact how the estrogen behaves in our body. Some of the toxins act like estrogen in a bad way and they kind of cause cells to grow. But I think where the the really big confusion comes is that some breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive. So they're fed by estrogen. So women are told your breast cancer is estrogen fed. How that gets interpreted is my cancer was caused by estrogen, but that's not true. Estrogen, it, it's a signaling hormone. It's a chemical that goes through your body that tells your cells what to do, but it doesn't tell cells to turn into cancer cells. It just tells cells whether to grow or not to grow or, or whatever. So because there's this belief that estrogen caused their cancer, it just feeds into this idea that estrogen is dangerous. And, and it's really not true. The reality is that your, your breast cells all have estrogen receptors on them. That's normal. They're supposed to have estrogen receptors on them. And so if your cancer was estrogen receptor positive, that just means that it's a better prognosis because your cell is closer to a normal breast cell. Once it's a very aggressive kind of cancer, the cells get mutated, they change. Now the estrogen receptors go away. That's worse. That's, you know, you don't want that kind, but it's just been so confusing. So 
when the study came out and said, oh no, estrogen is dangerous, women went off their hormone replacement therapy in droves. And a whole generation of women were told, don't go on hormones. Like they thought they were doing the right thing for themselves, right? So this was 20 years ago. So those are the women who are about 50-ish, 20 years ago. Now they're 70-ish and they've got the osteoporosis and, you know, all the aging. And way back in 2009, like already way back then, somebody did a study and they crunched the numbers and they figured out that approximately 90,000 women, and maybe it was 2011. Anyway, approximately 90,000 women had died unnecessarily because they went off their hormone replacement therapy, which is more than like what they had predicted would have gotten the breast cancer, even with the synthetic hormones. So what we know today is Bioidentical hormone replacement therapy with the natural form of progesterone has not been shown to increase the risk for breast cancer. We also know that if you are on bioidentical hormones and then you get breast cancer anyway because of the environmental stuff or whatever, you are actually less likely to die from your breast cancer. You actually have a better prognosis. So the fear is just so pervasive and it's really mostly here in America. Because other countries are sort of over this, especially in Europe, countries that have socialized medicine, they can keep track of people like, you know, they have everybody's medical records and they can do a lot of statistics. So like in Finland, they did a study and they looked at all the women on hormone replacement therapy and they showed that women who were, and they use the bioidentical hormones over there. It's only here that we're so tied to these synthetic drugs. But what they found is women on hormone replacement therapy had less heart attacks, not more. They had less breast cancer, not more. They lived longer, like there was less death from any cause. There were such better outcomes. So in the UK now, in England, women can get bioidentical hormones for free from the government because they have figured out that this is going to help protect their medical system. Because, you know, as we get older, right, we're a burden on society with all of our medical problems. So in order to protect their version of Medicare from going bankrupt, they are preemptively giving women bioidentical hormones to keep them healthier, to save the whole country money. Yeah. I mean, yeah, amen. <laughs> Yes to this. Yes to this. And I love the way that you lay it out because I, I is this is massively confusing. This is very scary. You could even go pick up bioidentical progesterone from your pharmacy. They will still give you the printout all about how this is going to cause cancer. You need to be really warned. Um, it's very behind the times, despite some of the guidelines, even North American Menopause Society in 2019, all through Europe. It just it hasn't caught up and, and we're seeing it more in this in the literature you know i saw a whole big like what what have we learned in 20 years from the whi trial you know this whole review and a lot of the authors have gone back and i mean they don't say oopsies but they're like oops he's <laughs> not like mm. <laughs> turns out that was wrong yep there's a doctor named peter atia and he says that this whole hormone replacement thing that like doctors caused the problem and it is the biggest like medical calamity that medicine has ever made in his opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I've heard his interview with the authors of Estrogen Matters. You know, that's, I yes. have that Great on my shelf. I've read it several times and it's, yeah, absolutely. All right. So now that everyone's like, got it. All right. We've got, <laughs> yes, let's go. How do you take bioidentical hormone replacement? And you mentioned uterus versus no uterus. Like there's some of these nuances that could be, again, confusing. Okay. So let's do the uterus versus no uterus first. So um, in the conventional world, what we were trained is that we give women estrogen for the benefits of estrogen. And then um, we just give the progesterone in order to prevent the uterine side effects. That's the only purpose of progesterone as far as what we're taught in medical school. But I got to tell you really quickly, my story is, so I'm having those panic attacks at night. I was a nutcase. I was wigging out over stupid things. My husband thought I was the wicked witch of the West. He's like, who the heck is this woman? And where's the one that I married? And I, I didn't know. I mean, I, I didn't understand what was going on with me until I read a book by Suzanne Summers. And I didn't want to read the book because who wants to get their medical advice from a celebrity, right? But that is where I learned that progesterone is a calming hormone. It binds to these receptors in our brain called GABA receptors. And GABA is the calming neurotransmitter. That's how Valium works. That's how Ativan works, Xanax, red wine. Like 
It was like this mind blown thing. No wonder I don't feel good. My progesterone's gone down and I'm a nutcase now. But so we were taught only if you have a uterus, that's the only time that we ever care about progesterone. But we have progesterone receptors in every part of our body. And actually the part of us that has the most progesterone receptors is our brain. So for, for doctors like us who do this whole person bioidentical approach, we give progesterone to all of our patients who have a brain, regardless of whether or not they have a uterus. That is the greatest, you need to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yes. So then we're going to, we're going to look at your labs and we're going to see, do you need estrogen? Do you need progesterone? Do you need testosterone? A lot of times it's a yes to all three. Sometimes you even need DHEA, which is another precursor hormone that comes from your adrenal gland. So we're looking at this big picture and um, there are actually a lot of different ways that we can do this bioidentical hormone replacement. And there's a lot of different factors to be taken into account. So some of these are covered by insurance. Some of them are not. Some of them come in the bioidentical form. Some of them don't. Um, for some women, like there's a convenience factor. Some things have to be done in the office. Some things, you know, you can just get at your local pharmacy. So um, one of the really common ways to do bioidentical hormones is with a topical cream. And typically there are some estrogen creams available from a regular pharmacy that are bioidentical. They could be covered by your health insurance but it would be only estrogen in that cream. And, and honestly, sometimes there's other things in the creams you don't really want, like parabens and preservatives and things that have been associated with breast cancer risk. So it kind of doesn't really quite make sense, but it is out there. So a lot of times what we do though, is we get the cream from a compounding pharmacy and a compounding pharmacy is a specialized pharmacy that personalizes the prescription just for you. So if you need a pinch of estrogen and a dollop of progesterone and like a little bit of testosterone, we can write the exact prescription and then they'll mix and match to make up something that's personalized just for you. It can be less expensive than having, even if your insurance covers some of these things, having to get all these different prescriptions, it's just convenient. It's just one cream that you apply once a day. And so that's one way that is very common. One of the criticisms of this is that this cannot be FDA approved. Can we talk about that for just a second? Please. Absolutely. Okay. So a lot of medical practitioners out there poo-poo this. And, and this is why they're sort of against bioidentical because in their brain, bioidentical means that it comes from a compounding pharmacy. It's not the molecular structure of the hormone. It's not the natural form. They don't even know which ones are natural and which ones are synthetic. It's because they think that it's going to come from a compounding pharmacy. We're not taught how to use compounding pharmacies. So, so we don't know, but you know, all pharmacies used to be compounding pharmacies. It's just now we've got, you know, all the chains and whatever, and big medicine. And so it's changed. But because every person's prescription is personalized to them, it's unique. And the way that the FDA works, if it's going to you know, pass something, every single dose has to be approved separately. So like if there's a 200 milligram ibuprofen capsule and a 400 milligram and a six, whatever, every single one has to get FDA approved separately. Well, this, this you couldn't possibly FDA approve every last possible dose because this is personalized. Everybody's dose is different, but the hormones they are putting in the cream are the exact same FDA approved stuff the pharmacist is buying it from the same companies that the pharmaceutical companies get it from. It's not that they're like, we get the bioidentical hormones from ingredients that are in yam or soy, but it's not like the compounding pharmacist has a big cauldron in the back and they're mixing up a big pot with, you know, yams in it and, you know, extracting with their Bunsen burners. They're getting it from the same place. They're just personalizing it. So because doctors are unfamiliar with using compounding pharmacies, doctors have a tendency to be down on whatever they're not up on. And so when they're unfamiliar, they want to say no. But but that is one way we do it. There are other ways, though. We can do it in lozenges. They are called trochies. It's like kind of almost like a soft waxy piece that you just put under your tongue. It slowly dissolves right into your bloodstream. We have, um, for, for estrogen, we have patches that do come from the regular pharmacy. They typically are covered by your health insurance. Progesterone is sold over the counter as a topical cream, like at the health food store. We can get capsules that come either from the compounding pharmacy or from just the regular pharmacy. They're not the same thing. The regular pharmacy is immediate release. The compounding pharmacy is sustained release, but we've got options. These are all bioidentical. 
Testosterone is trickier though, because there is no FDA approved testosterone for women, but we can get it from the compounding pharmacy. It's, it's bioidentical testosterone. So it's the same for men though. There is, there is an FDA approved bioidentical and, and listen, all testosterone is bioidentical. Like it's only women where we've been using the synthetic stuff. Some doctors in my area don't feel comfortable using a compounding pharmacy because somehow they think that it's either not accurate or I don't know. So what they do is they prescribe the male stuff, the male testosterone, but men need 10 times more than women do. So basically what they tell them is just eyeball a pea-sized amount of the cream and that's the dose to use. So to me, that's so wildly inaccurate that it just doesn't make any sense. But for testosterone, those are two of the choices is the, the compounding cream or use the men's stuff and eyeball it and take a guess. The other thing that is available out there are hormone pellets and hormone pellets looks like a little tiny tic tac. And we numb the skin on the back of your hip. We make a little teeny weeny incision like a paper cut. The pellet goes under your skin and then it just put little steri strip band aids over it to close up the incision. And then it just slowly dissolves over the next three or four months. And there's pros and cons. So it's bioidentical. You get nice, stable, even release. You just go to, you know, it's a little procedure done in the doctor's office. And then you forget about it for the next, you know, three months or so. And then it's going to wear off and you go and get another one. So it's convenient. Um, there's times when it's not the best thing. Like if somebody's really, really sensitive to, you know, they, they're the person that gets the side effects from everything, you're probably better off to do something like a topical cream where you can control it. You can stop it. If you know you're getting side effects, you can adjust the dose a little bit easier. Um, on the other hand, if you're somebody who's like maybe a little ADD and you're always forgetting to put the cream on and you just can't be consistent, sometimes this can be like so much easier for people. But here's one thing that I would say is, there are practitioners out there that don't know the first thing about hormone replacement therapy, but they went to a weekend course to learn how to do this procedure to insert the pellets. It's not a complicated procedure for a doctor to learn how to do, so it's easy to teach somebody how to do this. The challenge, though, is that's they're a one-trick pony, and that's the only thing they know how to do. And not everybody is a great candidate for this. So if you are you know, talking to somebody about bioidentical hormones, and that is the only option is pellets, probably not the best place. It could be one of the options on the list, but you should be given choices. Um, you should be told the pros and the cons, which ones are covered, which ones are not covered, how expensive should you expect it to be, you know, what is convenient for you, but shouldn't be a one trick pony. Yeah, absolutely. And then you mentioned earlier the vaginal, which I want to bring up again, especially for the women who, you know, vaginal dryness is a thing, urinary leakage is super common, or that's just the route they prefer. Yeah. So we've talked about topical cream. When we do the topical cream, we practically never have you just do it on your regular skin. Like you can do it at the back of your arms, the inside of your thighs, but we generally actually don't recommend that anymore. When we do topical, what we recommend is to apply it to the inner labia, like the outer part of the vagina, because it soaks in much better through that mucous membrane skin and we get even better results. It's easier for us to measure it. So you can do it in the vagina and that's fine too, but it doesn't have to go inside. The outside is okay too. And there's some reasons why we want to get it all the way on up inside to the upper part of the vagina, but, but most of the time that's not necessary. And what we found is if we just, just use your finger to apply just a little bit of cream to that external area, it's very well tolerated for most women, as opposed to if you have like a syringe with a plunger and you have to put a whole bunch of cream up in the vagina, or you've got some kind of a suppository that kind of melts, they can be messy. And so a lot of women don't really like that. But, but if you just put it on the outside part, it just soaks right in. It's just a very tiny amount that we use and, and it works great. We get minimal complaints but it is good to know we got lots of choices. Yeah, a lot of options. When it comes to estrogen, I do get this question also, the difference between just doing estradiol, like in a patch, um, as opposed to something like a biest, which is estradiol and um, another estrogen known as estriol. You, I know you have, I was going to say, do you have thoughts? No, I know you have thoughts. <laughs> yeah, well, so I don't know the right answer here. This is a little bit controversial, even amongst you know, practitioners who do BHRT. So estradiol is the estrogen that our ovaries used to make. So that's the main one that we really need. So estradiol is the one that makes the hot flashes better. You know, your bones stronger, keeps your, you know, you can remember why you walked in the room. Estriol is a weaker estrogen and it 
it to some degree it kind of has some breast protective properties. So we think that if we were to combine the two, maybe we could help reduce, you know, problems with making breast cells grow more. So estrogen doesn't increase your chances of getting breast cancer anyway. So how much, how important is that estriol? You know, I don't really know. The other thing that estriol is very good for though, is it actually is very good for our pelvic floor. So the urinary leakage and the vaginal dryness and things like that, estriol works really, really nicely there. So especially if I have an older woman and her, those are really her main complaints, like the hot flashes are long gone by now. And sometimes then that combo where we're using the estriol and the estradiol together works really great. So we don't have to give as much estradiol and we can still do the job. So it used to be that we we said very strongly, we want to use mostly the estriol, the weak one with just a little bit of estradiol. And then we started saying, well, I don't know, maybe there's not enough research to prove that's the best thing. Maybe we should be doing like 50-50, you know, half and half. And then there are some practitioners who say, I don't know about this whole estriol thing. I think the most important one is estradiol. So we're figuring it out. There might be some circumstances where we might use one or the other. So for example, if I have somebody who has a history of breast cancer and they want help for the vaginal dryness, but they don't want to have to lay awake at night worrying if they made the right decision to be on estrogen, then I would give them estriol. So there's pros and cons and, and we're, we keep learning. I love it. And then are there absolute contraindications? I mean, is there, I know obviously it's very individualized to the person, but if you could cover some of the, like, look, in this case, we never, or there are certain things that's really important to know as we wrap this up. Okay. So if somebody actually like has breast cancer today and, you know, you were just diagnosed, then I think we would probably say this is not the time for you to be on estrogen. If somebody has a strong history of blood clots, we want to be really careful. We know that estrogen given as a pill, especially the synthetic estrogen given as a pill or the horse estrogens given as a pill, uh, more so even than the bioidentical, but still when you take it as a pill because of how your body processes it, it increases the risk of blood clots and that would be a bad idea. I wouldn't say though that if somebody has an increase in the risk for blood clots, it's not that I won't give them estrogen, but what I would do is I would give it to them topically and typically sort of, you know, on the inner labia as opposed to giving it to them by mouth. If somebody has unexplained postmenopausal bleeding, like you've gone a whole year with no period, and now all of a sudden you're having spotting or bleeding, that could be a sign of uterine cancer or fibroids, or like that shouldn't be happening, right? That's a clue that something is wrong. And estrogen could make that worse. So before you went on any kind of estrogen, we'd want to go and figure that out. And typically what we would do is send you to your gynecologist. They can do an ultrasound, a biopsy, whatever it is that they feel like you need. That's where your gynecologist becomes really important because gynecologists really are surgeons and we assume they should be the experts in hormone replacement therapy, but sometimes that's the opposite. So blood clots, abnormal bleeding, breast cancer, or, you know, if you have, like, if you've just had a mammogram and they've called you back and they're not really sure what's going on, you know, you're being investigated and it's kind of up in the air. That's probably not the right time to be on estrogen replacement. And then the other thing that I would say is if you're terrified, like if you, maybe you have a family history or, you know, you read something or your best friend had breast cancer, whatever it is, like, being on estrogen would just make you so worried. Then it's just like, don't do it. We, we've got a lot of things that we can do for the other hormones that can still make you feel better. And then you don't have to like, you know, lie awake at night and worry that you made the wrong choice. I love that. That's that's really good empowerment because there is a lot of we worry and fear, a lot of anxiety around, especially estrogen. Yeah. And, and let me make a special note of your mom had breast cancer. Most of the time, what happens is if your mom had breast cancer, you are told you are not a candidate for hormone replacement therapy. The reality is that only about 10% of breast cancers are genetic. So if your mom and her two sisters and her mom and her mom's two sisters all had breast cancer, okay, that's a totally different story, right? Like Angelina Jolie sort of famously had all her you know parts removed because she had a very strong history of breast and ovarian cancer and lost her mother at a very young age or grandmother. Like, so fine, that's a different story. But if your mom is literally the only person in the history of your family that had breast cancer, that doesn't mean that you can't still benefit from hormone replacement therapy. So of course we need to know your whole history and look at your risks and benefits and do all the things that 
anyway, we, whether you have a history or not, we should always be doing all the things we can do to be reducing your risk for breast cancer. And there's like lots and lots of things we can do there, but it doesn't mean that you can never benefit from all the really important benefits of hormone replacement therapy. Well, so speaking of breast cancer, and I mean, we only have a limited amount of time, so I might have to have you back to talk about this stuff. If you could just a couple sentences on, you know, the people who are going to say, well, I had breast cancer five years ago, 10 years ago, and I'm still symptomatic from a low hormone point of view. And I was told I could never touch hormones, any of them ever. It would come right back and they have a lot of fear and I don't blame them 100%. But even that data... And that narrative is changing. And I would like you to just touch on that. Sure. Okay. So here's my sort of stepwise thing that I would do. Generally, a lot of this conversation, like when I'm making my decisions, partly has to do with me and my medical license. Because I like my medical license. I would like to keep my medical license. And no matter what I believe, I might not believe the same thing as the people sitting on the medical board in my state who believe once you've had breast cancer, never, never should you ever like even be in the same room as a hormone. But what I would do if somebody came in and they're like five years out and, you know, it seems like they're doing well, then at least what I would do is, well, let me even go back. You just, you just got through your chemotherapy, like whatever, like you're fresh. I would start with looking at your cortisol level. I would want to look at nutrition, insulin, like there's lots of other things, other hormones that are uber, uber important that will reduce your risk of breast cancer and current uh, recurrence that we should be looking at that will make you feel better. So that's where we start. Once you're like five years out and, and you know, you want more another, the next thing that I would look at are the androgen hormones, testosterone, DHEA. So these ones can help you make the hot flashes go away, sleep better, feel more resilient, you know, more energy. They can really make you feel better. They are are going to convert to some estrogen in your body, but it's still going to be less than if you're really on hormone replacement therapy. Um, so that is something that I would consider with the right patient. Um, even if there may be earlier than, um, like if somebody is on a tamoxifen or there's some estrogen blockers that women get put on when they're being treated for hormone therapy, sometimes I will still give them testosterone because that estrogen blocker is going to prevent it from flipping over into estrogen. Um, and then as they get farther out, if they're still having issues, we can do the estriol, which is the one that can help with the vaginal dryness because that one does not promote breast cell growth. Um, so there's all these different things that we can be doing. And then when, when we've kind of exhausted everything else, if you are still miserable, then we just have a conversation to say, nobody can tell you that you'll never get a recurrence. You know, you here's your choices. If you would like to be on hormone replacement therapy, these are the risks and the benefits. And, you know, I'm happy to work with you. And, and I have to say, I'm really careful about who I work with because what if you get breast cancer again? Because I can't guarantee and I don't want you to go back and think, oh my gosh, I made the wrong decision. I so regret what I did. So, you know, I, I, I would say that I certainly wouldn't recommend it for everybody. But what we see is that being on the bioidentical hormone replacement therapy does not seem to increase your risk of getting breast cancer recurrence, but that's not to say that one of your doctors isn't going to say that to you and cast doubt and fear and, you know. Right. Which makes sense. And that's, I love, it's so interesting, the progression you just said, I had a, made me think of a patient I had years ago and she, by the time she came to CB, she was like 10 years post breast cancer. So she wasn't on any kind of estrogen block or anything, and she was miserable. So we worked on all the foundational stuff a couple years later, and I was in contact with her oncologist, who she still saw once a year. And finally, at like year 12, her oncologist said, all right, she can have DHEA. And I, we were like, woo! You know? And then like the next year, you know, he was like, okay, she can have vaginal estriol. You know, it was like this, like, woo! And so now she's 13 years post. And But the same thing, we, we just went through all the ri pros, cons, risk factors. Her oncologist happened to just slowly be a little more open, was heavily involved. She went back and saw him every year. A lot of unknown, but also she was miserable. And we were trying to help that. I'm finding more and more that oncologists are giving me the green light to do testosterone for women who have a history of breast cancer. So I think they're kind of coming along. There's even, there's even um, Dr. Glazer is a breast surgeon out there who is doing studies to show that testosterone reduces breast cancer. So she's literally taking a testosterone pellet, implanting it in the breast right next to the tumor and causing the tumor to shrink. So I wouldn't say you should be on testosterone like to prevent or whatever. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so strongly to say that, but you know, it's not the thing that increases the risk. Okay. 
Well, Dr. Dad, this has been absolutely educational and enlightening, just as I thought. How can people find you, find your book? If you're a practitioner look, listening, you have amazing education. So give us all the details. Okay. So if you are somebody who just wants to know, like, could it be my hormones? I wrote a book because a lot of time that's the thing. Like you don't feel good, but you're thinking to yourself, is it my hormones? I don't know. So I wrote a book. It's called, This is Not Normal, A Busy Woman's Guide to Symptoms of Hormone Imbalance. It's got a bunch of quizzes. So you can go through and take the quiz for low testosterone or high cortisol or whatever, and kind of get an idea. It's got some tips on how you can start to feel better. And it's got resources for where you can find a doctor who can actually help you wherever you are. And you can download a free copy at isityourhormones.com. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. My practice is Signature Wellness. So our website is signaturewellness.org org, and we have lots of, you know, resources and information and podcast episodes, all sorts of things on the website. So resources for people in order to work with us, you actually have to come to Charlotte because that's where my medical license is. So at least the first time we have to see you in person. And then for practitioners, I feel like how I can really make the most impact is not just by sitting one-on-one -on -one across the desk from one patient, but is from helping other practitioners learn how to do this. And um, specifically what I have found is it's, it's one thing to learn how to prescribe these bioidentical hormones. There are more and more places now where people can go to learn, but in order to actually have a practice where you can do this and be able to like not go out of business because we as practitioners don't know anything about business. I help practitioners start and, and get their practices going. So the program is called BHRT Practice Launch. And the best way probably to find me is I have a Facebook group called BHRT Practice Boost. So BHRT Practice Boost on Facebook um, is a great place. It's only for practitioners, um, but we share business tips on like how to start a practice so that you can really get in there and help people. I love this. And we will have all these linked below in the show notes too. So don't worry if you could not write that down fast enough, you can just scroll to the show notes and get those, get that information there. Uh, and I, I want to add and just sort of round this out for patients, clients, consumers listening. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, my primary care would never, my OBGYN would never, it's absolutely okay to add to your medical care team. It's absolutely okay to find a BHRT expert, find a graduate of Dr. Deb's program. If you're in Charlotte, find Dr. Deb's team and add to your medical care. If you love your primary care, but hormones is not their thing, now you understand why it's not their thing. It's complicated. And so finding somebody and bringing them on is okay. And you want it for your health, as you just learned in the last hour with Dr. Deb. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being on the Root Cause Medicine podcast today. I just love it. HRT is such a topic that requires so much nuance and you just bring it every time. So thank you. Thank you.